Good afternoon. My name is Bill Lewis, and I'm with uh, Occupy Boston TV here at the Brookline Access TV station. And I have today with me Sherry, who is one of our strongest advocates in the homeless community, and in particular, she is working with the Houses Crisis um, Working Group. And Sherry, why don't you tell us about what house, ho houseless? It's housing crisis. Housing crisis is all about. Um, well, it became the housing crisis working group after we left Dewey Square um, to embody all the issues that anyone who is in need of housing, whether you're homeless or you're a homeowner or a renter, has to deal with. And uh, right now, um, we're just trying to keep ourselves together because we don't have Dewey Square. And so we're trying to get more people interested and in coming up with actions. Mm -hmm. And um, you were telling me that you had some actions planned in particular uh, surrounding different aspects of the housing crisis and the foreclosure crisis that are going on. What, right. what kinds of things do you guys have in mind? Uh, we're considering, we haven't picked a date, but we want to demonstrate or maybe even do a march um, having to do with corruption or nepotism or anything like that, having to do with local housing authorities or Department of Housing and Community Development, anything in there that we find is uh, impeding the ability for individuals to get housing, um, we, we will demonstrate. And and, and so that you're aware that, that there have been some problems here in Massachusetts recently within some of the uh, housing groups and some of the governmental groups that mm -hmm. oversee. Well, you want to talk about those a little bit? Well, uh, we became aware of some... Uh, well, one aspect is we had support while we were in Dewey Square from a, a nonprofit that helps families uh, get housing and they are all about telling the truth about why some individuals are not getting houses in families aren't getting housing and the manipulation the state does to lower the numbers of uh, the homeless and the need for the housing mm -hmm. um, some of their tactics is you know they uh, hide them in hotels, you know, they, they, they'd rather spend money housing families in hotels um, in areas not so safe for their children um, than get them in stable housing. Mm -hmm. um, That's really disturbing and, and of course it, it's, it's surprising that, that we want our country to be a better place and it's what's been happening that, that this, this type of thing has been going on and for, for quite some time. I think it's the fear factor. Um, you're very intimidated, like um, single mothers with children, if, if, as an example they gave us, was uh, they have uh, a car and, and they go to a shelter, seeking shelter, they'll threaten to take their children away. And so they end up not getting into the system. One of the mm -hmm. reasons why they're putting them in the hotels is that they don't get into the shelter system and they don't get counted as homeless. Oh man, that that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, you, you yourself have uh, had experience with the shelter system. I know that you've been homeless for a while in different si uh, situations. Um, I understand that uh, it's not really fun to be in a shelter. No. Um, I was introduced at 9 p.m. at night. The lights were out, and I got a bed to sleep in, and I had a lot of stuff with me. It was a city-run shelter, and so you're allowed to have more things than other shelters. And you get to bed, you get your bed, get sheets, you go to sleep. You're lucky if you get a blanket. Um, this was in August, so it was pretty warm. Um, and you woken up at 5.30 in the morning with the lights turned back on and you have to be out of the dorm before seven. And so if you're someone who is able to work, they, there is like two to three hours before any business is open to allow you to get 
working on that to get a, you know, a job so you can get out of homelessness. But you have to be back to the shelter if you need a bed again by, before noon um, to secure a bed by 2 o'clock. So it makes it almost impossible to do what we really want. We want people to have the opportunity to go out and work and do good right. things in the world, and yet the, the system is working against them. Correct. And that's, that's pretty sad. Um, <clears throat> I know that we've had a good number, of pe good number of the people that we were camping with at Dewey Square have been homeless in different situations. And, of mm -hmm. course, since our eviction, we, we've been struggling with that. Right. Um, t tell us what you can say about uh, our, our own internal issues with our own people. Well, uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, houseless individuals uh, who are very, very much part of Occupy Boston. And a lot of them didn't like to self-identify, but because we are post Dewey Square, they have. And they've built relationships with other individuals, like myself. Um, I've built relationships with individuals. And it's sad that, you know, the, the reaction of some is that they're afraid to house other homeless or houseless individuals um, that they're not too familiar with. Mm -hmm. But um, that's part of what's going on. And some of the individuals that worked really, really hard and did really good for themselves in a way that the system wasn't helping them are back in the shelter system. And they can't participate. Mm -hmm. in the movement if they want to have a bed. As I told you, um, right. they, they give you a bed at 2 o'clock. Well, a lot of these shelters have curfews. And if you're given a bed you, in the city-run one, you can't leave the building. So there's prime time that you lose uh, in uh, job searching, networking, to get yourself out of that situation. Man. And... Um uh, obviously, you and I have been in a good number of working groups together, mm -hmm. and uh, most recently, uh, we, uh, I was attending, visiting, I suppose, for the first time, the Spaces Working Group, right. who are struggling with what is the future of Occupy Boston, what kind of physical presence do we want? And I had the feeling that even in that group, it was very unclear where we were, what we really wanted. I mean, we really want Dewey Square back. Right. But I don't think we're going to get that. Right. Um, I don't know the real estate aspect and the numbers game, you know, that these other individuals who are professionals know, but I just wanted to look for a place that we could have everything that was in Dewey Square in. And there are other individuals who have a different vision. And uh, the hope is, is that we can keep the overall vision even if we find a spot where is quote unquote headquarters, um, mm -hmm. but we can still help our in everyone within Occupy Boston with their housing needs, with their other needs that they were getting met in Dewey Square, which is why I proposed the mutual aid um, proposal. Right, right. We did the mutual aid proposal. That was the one we actually did at the bandstand, right? Dark, no, no. cold that night? No, it started at the community church. Ah, uh, okay, there was a previous proposal at the bandstand that was well, on a dark and stormy night. But the one we want to talk about, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> tell us, uh, we know approximately what we want in mutual aid. We, we want to help those members of our movement who are financially strapped in very right. sundry fashions. And <clears throat> figuring out uh, effective ways to do that Mm -hmm. is, of course, a challenge. Right. I know that we uh, passed a resolution to send uh, to pay for people to go visit other occupies, mm -hmm. which was a great thing. People had the opportunity to mix and exchange ideas, et cetera, right. et cetera. But it wasn't a solution to right. our problem. And neither is the mutual aid. It's not a solution. It's a Band-Aid while we wait and, and find a headquarters or a housing co-op that we can organize for the individuals who are houseless and those who are attending college and 
don't have anywhere to live at the moment, you know, because they took time off to be part of this movement. And, you know, some of them work full time, go to school full time, and participate <laughs> in Occupy Boston full time. How is that so, possible? I don't know. <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. I, I barely could do college full time if I'm working. So, um, so this was more like a band-aid solution to help with the little things that are impeding our ability to stay together as a movement. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we have m many of those uh, um, uh, impediments. Impediments. What's the word? Impedi impediments. Impediments. <laughs> <laughs> impediments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like we did a <coughs> census to see what was needed the most, and T passes, which was one of my hmm. main goals about it, because I had no, I have no income, mm -hmm. and I needed to be able to get to places and. That was my initial proposal, but then I decided to do it based on sort of the community action program model. Mm -hmm. um, if you're from, I don't know what Boston does, but I know in a little city, little town, you go to City Hall to apply for fuel assistance mm -hmm. and rental assistance, and sometimes they could cover the utility bills like a phone. And so I wanted to cover that because Individuals who may apply for some of these programs may not qualify because of income restrictions. And so that's why I included everyone, not just individuals without income. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. And has it been well used? Do we have a lot of people who are making use of it and, and who are able to uh, you know, participate more because of it? I get the feeling, yes, it mm -hmm. is helping. It needs a lot of work. Yeah. Like many things within Occupy Boston, it mm -hmm. needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So I know that Spaces was talking about um, possibly just meeting space, mm -hmm. possibly storefront space so that people who were on the outside street would see us and be able to come in and, and interact with it, and then possibly something that would incorporate housing space so mm -hmm. that we could actually live. But at the same time, we're constantly hearing that once we try to do things legally, it gets a lot harder. Right. That's why um, I might have to create another working group and talk to some individuals about the cooperative housing. Mm -hmm. So if I do come up with a new working group, I'll probably separate from the spaces and let them deal with that and deal with that issue. Because I think it's possible for us to do a cooperative housing. Um, I, what I think... Um, a lot of the reasons why people gravitated to the Occupy movement is they, they knew something was wrong, something mm -hmm. wasn't working. And if we could do certain uh, actions like my mutual aid, mm -hmm. my, you know, or not my, but I mean, there's a lot of a actions we're doing that defies the system in a way. And if we could do a cooperative housing with individuals who either don't qualify because they have income that is high or they don't qualify because they have no income in that uh, or they have bad credit history um, or the waiting list for housing could be two to five to ten years when you apply for public housing. If we could defy that system and say these individuals who are in need are good citizens and mm -hmm. need this housing, then we could show that, you know, yes, and we indeed, can help. Uh, and of course, these are not people who are trying to be lazy or goof off. Or they re most of these people I know really, really want to have a good job that pays a decent wage, and I mean. My two cents worth is if there were good jobs for people in this country who just paid a halfway decent wage, that, that Occupy Boston wouldn't even exist because we'd be out working. And My mom always said that $10 an hour should be the minimum wage. That's, you know, the starting living wage. $10 an hour. So if you work a full 2,000-hour year, that would be $20,000 a year. 
For a single individual, if you're no kids? single with no kids, yeah, you can make. <laughs> I have a friend with two kids. She was making 25K and mm -hmm. getting housing assistance and mm -hmm. some other assistance. She got a higher paying job, $10,000 higher. Mm -hmm. And they cut her aid, they cut some of yep. her medical, and she ended up being worse off. Yeah, it's the system and like welfare, as everyone calls it, is a system of enforced poverty, you know, and you get food stamps in depending on the, the part of the country you're in and in your town, you may not be close enough to a good grocery store. So you end up getting junk food because that's the easiest thing to get sure. when you're homeless and you def uh, re rely on the shelters, they do give you food stamps, but you can't bring in food to cook for yourself. And you have to eat what they give you, which tends to be high in complex carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And one of the other leading causes of homelessness has to do with medical bills and health care sure. needs. And if you have people with serious health conditions and you're giving a high complex carbohydrate diet, you're, mm -hmm. you're causing illness. Yeah, really. Wow. Um, I, I understand that you have a blog that's going now. Yeah, I've been working on it. I need to work on it more because I know I can <laughs> write more than just a few paragraphs, but uh, it was a, it's part of a project for homeless individuals in the country um, to be able to blog for free. It's called IamHomelessGirl.com. Mm -hmm. um, I got it while I was at Dewey Square and like the influence and what I wanted to do was help with transportation for those who have uh, limited to no income that mm -hmm. are that are homeless or they do have their own own place like individuals on fixed income like my mom mm -hmm. was on disability which is again another type of enforced poverty um, sometimes you don't have enough money after you pay your bills with your disability and you need assistance for for rides mm -hmm. and different states and different cities have different criteria for it so if I could provide a monthly pass for a disabled individual which is only $20 mm -hmm. that would help that individual get their stuff done yeah and if you're homeless and you're under a curfew you, you have limited time, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's not homeless and has a job can get some errands done within a day or two, but it could take a week or two for someone who is homeless to get done. I understand. Wow. Um, life is tough, and when you're on the bottom, it gets tougher. Yes. So, what good things has come out of Dewey Square? You, you've been so involved <laughs> in everything that was there, I just remember you all over the place. Um, <laughs> well, my mom passed away June 26, and um, I came here in July and became part of Occupy Boston in October. And I kind of feel like I have a new family. <laughs> uh, I did, I, I emphasized a lot in GA when we were in Dewey Square that a lot of the individuals who are in our camp that are homeless have lost that support system in their family, mm -hmm. whether it was their own fault or it was their family own, you know, prejudices and, and just, you know, issues that their family had with that individual. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and we have to become that support system for the homeless and houseless within Occupy Boston because it's, it's what gets you up in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, uh, knowing that somebody actually does care about your situation and you yeah. don't have to be alone. So do, do you, you, you feel that you made a good number of friends there from yeah, all I of did. it? I've got people that have helped me store my belongings because I couldn't afford storage. Mm -hmm. um, they've let me stay with them in their homes which is a tricky thing because federal uh, guidelines for HUD, um, if you're applying for public housing, me, they take you off the priority listing if you're couch surfing. Wait, 
if, if a friend of yours says, you can crash on my couch tonight, and like the, the, the uh, department of... Uh, that, the, you know, HUD. HUD. Housing and Urban Development, I think that's what it's called. Um, it's the organization in charge mm -hmm. of housing, federal level of mm -hmm. housing. And um, if you are homeless uh, and you applied for public housing for the, either on a federal or state level, if you're couch surfing, they take you off priority. They take you momentarily off the list. Yeah. I think that that's one thing I want to work with someone in legislation on trying to see if we could come up with a way to define this better. I mean, when you apply for Medicaid and um, food stamps, you have to prove your living situation. Mm -hmm. If you need cash assistance, you also have to prove your living situation. Mm -hmm. So if you could prove that uh, you are a financial burden for someone and you cannot be put on a lease, I think that should be a guideline that, okay, at any moment they could kick you out, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. That isn't what we want. Right. Um, I mean, basically, what, what we want is for all of our citizens to be secure in, in, their, in their life and in their right. health and their livelihood. And, you know, I personally um, say, work yeah. make just make sure that everybody has the opportunity to work make up jobs for them yeah and that's one of the ideas I have if we had cooperative housing there's a lot of people who have um, mental illnesses of some sort like mm -hmm. OCD and I, I it's funny to talk about for some people because it's like it's not funny for that individual who mm -hmm. has OCD but if somebody has this the thing about security like checking the locks Mm -hmm. Make that their job, because you're not yeah. you're not um, belittling them mm -hmm. of their illness. You're you're just letting them deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's <laughs> it's something. Another individual, John Murphy, who's mm -hmm. um, really a hard worker within the Occupy movement, said that housing is a human right, and we have to start working on that and emphasizing that as a human right because if you don't have housing you can't get a job and you, you, and you, you can't, can't get a job without housing. yep <laughs> catch 22 and you go around in circles right and around in circles and you chase your tail and it's a and it's a terrible thing and yet sometimes uh aspects of the system do work and certainly people do uh, do exactly what we want there are people who have gone through horrid circumstances, gone through the system, and somehow come out on top and are now independent, uh, mm -hmm. you know, productive citizens who are, you know, exactly what we want in this country and, and in the whole world. Yeah, and but it's a hard system to get through. Oh, man, <laughs> I feel myself very fortunate that I didn't have to deal with any of these problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's see, what else should we talk about? How about you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have to talk about you. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, um, I, I've been here in Occupy Boston since that first week in October. Mm. And um, I think that it has just been the most wonderful thing in the world. It's made a huge difference in my life. It's made a huge difference in your life. And I think that um, what we are doing, bringing awareness of the rest of the world to the problems uh, that, that exists, the inequities, the insanity that sometimes reigns in this country, in this world. Mm -hmm. It's the most valuable things that any of us could be doing with our lives right now. Well, your smiling face and your positive attitude is always something that I like to see at all of our GAs and our meetings. Well, Sherry, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>